because usually what we do is we start with the precondition inside the substitution and try to come up with the post condition. This time it's doing it exactly backwards, okay? We are still dealing with the variable x in this case. We only have one single variable in the entire code to deal with, so it has to be variable x. The question is, what am I going to put here? x plus 32. x plus 32. Okay, it's f of x. Okay, it's not f prime of x. We don't use the rever inverse function, we use the function itself. Okay, now is that making any sense? Okay, what is post 17 again? Post 17 in this case is x does x equal to 35 exactly. And then we have x here, and what is f of x? x plus 32, right? And after the substitution, what do we get? x plus 32 equals 35, and if you carry out the simplification, x equals 3. So it does work out. And it does work out not only in this case, but it works out in general. Okay, I can give you a much more complex line other than x plus 32. As long as that function, the right hand side, is reversible, you can use this approach. If it is not reversible, you cannot use this approach. If it's not reversible, there's no way you can use substitution to reverse the operation. But as long as it is, you can use this approach. So that means, you know, if I give you a super long function on the right hand side, and I give you the inverse function also, then you will be able to reverse the step and say, okay, if I know what is post 17, then I will also know what is pre 17. Yep. Question eight. Does it mean uh, if it's not reversible, we cannot track back? Then that branch is dead. Yes, you cannot track we, back. We, that is we correct. Have a forget rule, so we cannot uh, exactly. restore that. If you use a forget rule, or if the right hand side is not reversible, then you cannot, you know, you cannot back, how should I put it? Then you cannot back propagate beyond that point, which also means in the actual case of debugging, if your program is behaving like this, and it is not the proper behavior, that means you have to stop on line 17 and see what it was, see what the value was before it gets changed to 35 or whatever because it's no longer possible to use logic to push your deduction back that step, then you actually have to stop the program when it, when it gets to that point, and then you can inspect, okay, what exactly is x, you know, at that point. Does that make any sense? So, you know, that's basically a debugging technique more than anything else. It's a debugging technique, but the technique itself is derived from our knowledge of using the pre and post conditions. Except in this case, we start with a post condition and we're trying to push our way back to see what is the precondition of a certain line. And, we can, and what we want to do is to try to push it as far back as possible. So that way, we can basically say by the time we move back to, let's say, you know, line 13, you know, then we can say, okay, by induction or by deduction, x can be this value, can be this value, can be this value, can be this value, okay? And then you can you know, continue to do that to see if you can get to a point where, oh, by the way, at this point, x is not supposed to be of this value. So you continue the debugging process, but without actually using a debugger, just by using logic. Okay. And of course, these days, people don't do that anymore. <laughs> these days, people don't do that anymore. They just you know, use a whole bunch of print statements. You know, every all, on every other line, they print what is the value of x, you know, so that they can just look at the output of the program to basically keep track, oh, okay, so now we have a history of the value of x, you know, getting changed, and we'll use that approach. And this approach is only doable in, you know, when two conditions are true. One, the, uh, pro, uh, the software development tool is easy to use. And two, you don't have a whole lot of stuff to track. Because if you have a lot of variables to track, or this is stuck in a very tight loop that has to execute 60,000 times, then your printout is going to be really long and confusing to read anyway. So in that case, it is not a viable or feasible way to debug a program. Uh, if you reverse the clock, 
say 30 years, okay, so in the 1970s, when people use mainframe computers to, for database applications or, or for data processing, they have to pay a hefty m amount of money just to use the processor time. Okay, it's, you, it's, cal it's, it's the, these, these are all invoiced on a second by second basis. So you don't want to burn up, you know, mainframe time, you know, for debugging a program by trying different things and looking at the output. So when your program does not work, what do you do? You analytically analyze a program and say, at this point, I know it is wrong, and this variable has this value. Now, can I push it back and find out where the problem was in order to lead to this point of the program? Okay, so this is actually, you know, useful technique. But getting back to our question, this is answering one question. Okay, so if we know what is pre-17, can we know what is pre-16? Pre-16 equals to... Um, pre-17. Pre well, pre-17 or something, right? Pre-17 or something. And that something has to do with the other branch. Okay? The other branch... Okay, let me just repeat this point here. The other branch is when x is greater than or equal to 17 on line 16, skips line 16, and merge on line 18. If that is the path that I took, what would be the value of x before line 16? It would be exactly 35, right? Because we did not have a chance to change it. So in this case, we did not have a chance to change the value of x from line 16 to line 18 so that <coughs> pre-16 must include x equals to 35. Now, I see how I use the word include. Pre-16 must include x equals to 35, but it is not exactly x, 30, x equals to 35 because it can also be x equals to 3. So when you combine the two branches, okay, combining the two branches, it means pre-16 must include x equals 3 and x <coughs> equals 35. So that means pre-16 equals x equals 3 or x equals 35. Is that making any sense so far? Am I, am I doing it step by step enough that you know the, the steps are clear? how one step leads to another step. So you guys are now all experts in debugging a program <laughs> just by looking at the, the symptoms of a program. I really think that we should teach a class, you know, just for, you know, looking at programs analytically and try to build and, and, and use all the debugging techniques and tools that are available. It will probably be a class after CISP 360, so we'll combine techniques like this along with techniques they can also use using a debugger. Because this alone is painful. And you can only push it so much you know, ahead of time. But by combining this kind of technique with a debugger, then you have a, you have a combination of the best of both worlds. Okay? You can use a debugger to, to basically do the type of debugging that is not possible using this, but then for everything else, you can also use this technique to basically move, to move a few steps earlier without actually have to printing the value.